This is how the original God of War began back in 2005. Kratos slices through undead soldiers on a boat in the middle of the Aegean Sea. And this is how God of War 2018 begins. Kratos stoically chops down a tree marked for his deceased wife's funeral pyre. These games might share the same name, but there is a world of difference between them. Over the course of the original six games, we explored many aspects of Kratos' tragic history in Greece. After a few years off, we picked up with an older, more mature Kratos living in the Scandinavian lands up north. The franchise needed something new, and to achieve that, it had to grow up. God of War pulled it off. Here's how. One of the most beautiful things about 2018's God of War is that, despite half a dozen games of history, it manages to stand alone. This is the tale of a father and son scaling a mountain to spread the ashes of a woman named Faye. Kratos' wife, Atreus' mother, is gone, and they are grieving. It certainly strengthens the story if you're familiar with what happened before this moment, but it's not required. And, let's be honest, there are already enough interpretations of all these gods out there. Tis true. For example, I'm the version you get when you pick up a regular hammer. I might not be able to lift Mjolnir, but anyone can wield a Black & Decker. Honestly, the ability to stand alone, not needing to always lean on others, is one version of maturity. In that respect, God of War grew up simply by being brave enough to go for a soft reboot. But there are so many aspects of this game that reinforce its newfound maturity. From how the world is designed, to the way you fight through it, to the shared journey of Kratos and Atreus, God of War really did grow up. But we cannot stay here. That line isn't just for Kratos and Atreus' safety. It's indicative of everything I've said so far. God of War can't stay in one sophomoric place forever. It must change. And the very world Kratos lives in tells him that at every turn. He says that line right after a three-stage battle with Baldur, an invincible god who feels no pain. Your attempts to kill him are futile. He always comes back and continues to fight. That's a sign for Kratos. Brute strength isn't enough to kill this god, nor is it enough to get through this stage of life. He can't stay here physically, and he can't stay like this internally. Even grunt enemies reinforce this. Shortly into their shared journey, Kratos and Atreus encounter a gang of Reavers. As expected, Kratos makes short work of them. But this is not his world anymore. Killing someone in his way isn't the easy answer. The Reavers rise again in icy undead forms. Oof, how chilling. What, we Aesir gods like a bit of wordplay? When it comes to combat scenarios like that, it's pretty obvious to say that this is a world that doesn't want Kratos around, but we can see that even in the ways we explore it. Consider how many different collectibles or objectives are only possible because of Atreus. Kratos can't read runes, so he's dependent upon his son to understand the world around him. Boy. Sir. There's a Yetner settlement ahead. In this way, Kratos is essentially being forced out of the spotlight. Yes, he is still the titular god of God of War, but he's not a lone wolf in this game. He's a co-pilot with Atreus. There is an exception, of course, because like any good drama, the two of them are eventually separated. Atreus is on his deathbed, and Kratos needs to journey into Helheim, the land of the dead, alone to find an ingredient that will save his son. Kratos has gone to the underworld many times in these games, but this visit is different. The realm of death should be familiar territory, but here, it isn't. Kratos is already out of his depth in Midgard, depending on Atreus for reading comprehension and for making connections with residents like Brock and Sindri. Now, he's alone, trudging through hell. It's clear how useful Atreus would be even in this dangerous place. There are numerous collectibles you simply can't get without his magic arrows. This arc demonstrates another aspect of what growing up really means. 
you can't escape the past. Before going to Helheim, Kratos has to return home and equip his old weapons, the Blades of Chaos. These represent a painful past, one that's literally buried under the new life and house that he's built. Hello, symbolism! By taking up the blades once again, Kratos embodies the concept of not running from your past. In many ways, that's the coward's path. You have to be willing to look back on it, own up to your mistakes, and learn from them to improve yourself in the present. I once crushed my Lady Sif's favorite wine goblet in my hand during a party. Since then, I've only used my own. Of course, the Blades of Chaos are only one part of Kratos' arsenal, and combat in this game is largely unlike any previous God of War. That's because your primary weapon for a good chunk of the game is the Leviathan Axe, and it represents the opposite of those blades. It's the cool, composed precision of an axe versus the raging fire of burning chains. Consider how the Leviathan Axe is used in combat. For the most part, you're going to target just a single enemy at a time, hacking them apart before moving on to the next one. You can throw the axe for quite a distance, but you have to be precise in your aiming. Even this ranged attack draws a contrast between the two weapons. The axe freely leaves your hands and comes back when recalled. The Blades of Chaos are burned into Kratos' arms, inseparably attached to his flesh. These contrasts paint the axe as a more mature, grown-up weapon. You can't just wildly lash out across the battlefield. You have to be deliberate. Fights against Soul Eaters are some of the most demanding of this tactic, as the only way to damage them is to hit their exposed core whenever they rear back for an energy attack. Kratos also carries a shield. It's a type of weapon he's used before, but in conjunction with the axe, it serves a more patient purpose. Time your guards right, and you can execute powerful counterattacks. There's a reward for sitting back for a moment, for taking a pause from all-out offense. These pauses can also be beneficial for the axe. If you wait a moment after swinging, Kratos will actually switch stances and execute totally different attacks. Both of these special moves require temperance, the virtue of holding off now for a better reward later. Let yourself sink back from the combat for a moment to counter or switch stances, and you'll pull off stronger attacks. Patience is a virtue, though I confess it is one I often lack. Speaking of which, Sif is actually waiting for me at the feasting hall, so if we could maybe hurry this thing up. There's a clear division in these combat styles from the moment Kratos picks the Blades of Chaos back up. From that point on, enemy mobs are much more common. Your first fight with the Blades is against what feels like an entire army of ice zombies in your own front yard. It's a flashback of sorts, demonstrating what previous battles felt like for Kratos. And it's a painful reminder of that past. But this is where that message of embracing and learning from it comes into play. Kratos can combine the Blades of Chaos with his new techniques, incorporating the shield and stances here as well. These contrasting styles even play out in the game's puzzles, which also lean on your weapons. Using the Leviathan Axe to hit targets requires precise aiming and timing, and it also forces you to think outside the box on many occasions. For example, you can hit these roots in Alfheim by throwing the axe from one room, but recalling it near the gate in the adjacent room. Conversely, the Blades of Chaos can carry the Winds of Hell to unlock doors and power up magical devices, but it's a race against the clock every time. All of this serves to demonstrate the grown-up nature of God of War. You've got a totally new, more precise weapon that's mostly meant for one-on-one -on -one duels and the thinking player's puzzles. Then you've got the wide-swinging, crowd-controlling Blades of Chaos. These are used in what often feel more like time trials than proper puzzles. Together, these help usher in a new era of God of War, without forgetting what got it there in the first place, accepting the past and learning from it to create something new. I actually crafted Sif a new wine goblet after the previous incident. She shall be drinking from it tonight. So far, we focused on Kratos and his place in this game. But as I said before, Atreus is an equal partner here. God of War starts in a more mature place already, but the story between them demonstrates further growth. Spartan Rage is always at your disposal, but it's intended as a protective measure to keep Atreus safe. Look at how it's activated when the two are separated. Kratos is constantly suppressing this anger around his son. He doesn't want to set a bad example, 
especially since he's the only parent now that Faye is gone. What are you doing? Now his guard is up. Only fire. Only fire when I tell you to fire. Kratos has been through hell, literally and figuratively, but Atreus is not yet jaded. Therefore, it's on Kratos to change for the sake of his son. In the first act, he often has to calm Atreus' own anger. Atreus doesn't know about his godhood until much later, and it's clear that Kratos wants this hidden from him for the time being. There's almost a fear of his own son sometimes. One side quest involves the bodies of two dead raiders, a father and son. The son stabbed the father, and the rest of the raiding crew eventually turned on the son, violence begetting more violence. Another example of a world that demands Kratos grow up and change things. Of course, he killed his own father Zeus at the climax of the previous saga. You don't even have to play those games to see it for yourself. A ghostly flashback in Helheim plays out the events in front of both us and Atreus. Kratos wants an end to this cycle. He doesn't want a situation where Atreus turns on him just like he did to Zeus. In fact, he wants the opposite. He wants Atreus to be better than him. We are more than that. The responsibility is far greater. And you must be better than me. Of course, Atreus is still pushed into this violent world as a necessary step in his own journey. Remember those Reavers that came back to life? During that same scene, Atreus kills his first human. He's visibly shaken, the weight of taking another man's life crystal clear in his young eyes. Ugh, I don't even have a jape for this one. I just feel for the little guy. The story of Atreus going from timid boy to manly warrior really begins there. His bow and arrows get incorporated into combat, again proving that this is a shared story between him and his father. Upgrades are split between the two of them too. Armor and skill slots are available for both of them. As Atreus grows as a fighter, his options expand. Light and shock arrows are added to his quiver, and some enemies even require his skills in conjunction with yours. Revenants must be pinned down before you can start smacking them around, and Atreus is the one who frees himself and his father from the grip of an ogre the first time you encounter one. Kratos and Atreus grow together in this respect. Kratos' narrow focus on completing the main quest is at odds with Atreus' desire to help others. They're able to reach a compromise when Kratos realizes that helping others might mean rewards and resources that will help them in their journey, a trade-off that Atreus quickly understands. Will you find them for me? Is there anything you can offer us in return? Even so, Atreus learns valuable lessons from these quests. In one instance, his reward is being attacked by a revenant that was supposed to help him reconnect with his dead mother. Not everyone can be trusted. As we've demonstrated several times now, this is a dangerous world. By the time Atreus learns of his true status as a god, his timidity is gone. Kratos' worst fears start to be realized as Atreus begins getting a big head because of his higher status. Ah, but who's worthy enough to judge? Quiet head. We are. We know better. Uh huh? Sounding more like your da by the moment. Soon after, this pridefulness becomes their undoing when the duo fight Baldur once again. This time, the battle results in the destruction of the Jotunheim Archway, their one path to the mountain where they were supposed to spread Faye's ashes. This is another turning point for Atreus, as he learns that violence leads to a destruction that affects more than just the hotheads who are actually fighting. The father-son bond is what ultimately remedies this. In a small but poignant moment, Kratos fixes Atreus' broken quiver with the tip of a mistletoe arrow. If you know your Norse mythology, then you already see the foreshadowing here. Oh, I know this one! But you've been doing all the spoilers, so I'll let you have it. When Baldur gut-punches Atreus, that mistletoe arrow proves to be his own undoing. Another example of violence leading to unforeseen consequences. With his invulnerability lost due to the piercing mistletoe, Baldur is ultimately killed by Kratos, but not before Atreus has one more grown-up revelation. He's beaten father. Not a threat. Kratos' fears are relieved in that moment. Atreus sees that revenge is not the answer. It only perpetuates the cycle of violence. 
We wouldn't have reached this point if not for the small act of fatherhood in which Kratos affixes the mistletoe arrow to Atreus's quiver. Nor would we have reached this moment without Atreus going through his own cycle of growing as a man, a warrior, and a god. Unfortunately, Balder doesn't learn the same lesson. The cycle ends here. Must be better than this. There's a fantastic quote from Kratos early in the game, but I've saved it until now because it really sums up the entire theme. I'm sorry. Do not be sorry. Be better. Throughout this video, we've seen how God of War grew up. There's some stuff in the past games that really wouldn't fly nowadays, but God of War 2018 doesn't apologize for it. Instead, it's better. It's grown up. It acknowledges Kratos' conquest of Greece and forces him to reconcile with it in a strange new land that's intent on conquering him. It equips him with more deliberate weapons and combat strategies, but gives him a chance to incorporate his old blades into the process too. And it demonstrates character growth for both Kratos and Atreus, having worked through tragedy, grief, and conflict on their quest to spread Faye's ashes. In many ways, Atreus' arc is a microcosm for the series at large. Like Atreus, we began Kratos' journey as budding warriors. And just as Atreus became prideful at the realization of his powers, we got too comfortable in these games, taking glee as we sought revenge against the gods of Mount Olympus. In the end, Atreus realizes that this bloodlust isn't the only path forward. That is what God of War 2018 demonstrates. Finding your place in a broken world, using all the tools from your past to push forward, embracing familial bonds and strengthening your relationships, that is how we reach our goals in a grown-up manner. We did it. We did. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. If you like what Framework is doing, definitely hit that subscribe button in the middle. It would help me out an awful lot if you do. And if you want to see what we've already cooked up, you can hit that link on the far left. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.